Hi, I'm Denton Bramwell. Welcome to Process Behavior Charts, Voice of the Process. Everything we do is a process. Getting a haircut, paying our bills, making a product, launching an ad campaign, hiring people, or closing the financial books. Some processes have metrics, and some of those with metrics are important and worth tracking and understanding. And if you want to do that, process behavior charts, also known as control charts, are a good tool for you. They'll let you know if your process has significantly changed. They'll give you some indication if you can plan on the process working again tomorrow. If you're doing root cause analysis, it will help you concentrate your investigation in places that are likely to show you informative events. Now, the two that we're going to study don't require much in the way of assumptions. For example, they don't require any particular distribution, such as a normal distribution or a binomial distribution. And that's one thing that lets them keep right on working under conditions where other tools would break down. The two important types of charts we're going to study are the individuals and moving range chart and the X bar and R chart, maybe with a little mention of the X bar and S, which is less common and a lot like the X bar and R. The less commonly used uh, charts that we're not going to talk, talk about include the P chart, the NP chart, the C chart, and the U chart and those do require particular distributions of the data. A couple of other specialty items that we're not going to spend much time on are exponentially weighted moving average charts and cumulative sum charts, which you hardly ever see anymore. Let's spend a couple of minutes on some basic ideas that we will use throughout the rest of this uh, module. There are a couple of different kinds of variation. One is real change in the process. Somebody adjusted the machine or changed the process or there was a huge weather event that interrupted things, something like that. We call that signal or extraordinary variation or special cause or assignable cause. Real change is potentially interesting and worth understanding. It's the voice of the process signaling that something has happened. The other kind of variation is just random noise, and practically all sets of measurements contain some of it. And we call that noise, random variation, common cause. Individual random data are not interesting. There's no point in trying to find the cause for a difference between any two points in a set of random data because the difference between two random numbers is just another random number. The fundamental job of the process behavior chart is to separate signal from noise. And it will tell you if what's happening is likely a real change or best attributed to just random variation. That's important. You don't want to spend your time trying to chase down the cause of random variation. That's pointless. If data are just random, then we can predict, predict within limits where the next point will happen. Uh, boring, stable, Predictable, in-control processes are normally what we desire uh, unless we're trying for change. Now, it's an important uh, fundamental idea that data have no meaning apart from their context. Putting the chart, putting the data in the process behavior chart uh, puts it in an informative historical context. The way that the charts are made, we have to have a vertical scale. Then we put in our data in order, horizontally spread out. Uh, we 
draw in a center line and we draw in limits. It's important to realize that if we're using the chart as I've described here, the center line and the limits come from the data. They do not represent a desire or an expectation or a target or a specification. Hmm, I think I'll work from this side just for a change. There. It's time to take a look at the first of the two charts that we're going to study. And that's the individuals and moving range chart. Sometimes we call that the I and MR chart. Don Wheeler, who's one of the world's experts on the topic, prefers the, the uh, title XMR. And both of those work perfectly well. Uh, the INMR chart was not the first chart developed, but it's probably the most widely used. It was attributed to W.J. Jeanette in England in 1942. It really was not very widely used until Wheeler did a lot to popularize that in the 1970s. The top chart is the uh, data. And that could be accounts receivable, days outstanding, uh, the value of inventory each month, could be a dimension on a uh, part that we're manufacturing. The lower chart is just the difference between successive upper chart values disregarding sign. So point number two is the difference between points one and two. Point three is the difference between point two and three, again disregarding sign. Both have a center line, and uh, in this case, that's the mean of the upper chart, and the lower chart is the mean of the moving ranges. Now, you can also use medians. Uh, that's perfectly okay, but the common use is means. The limits are set three standard deviations above and below the mean for the upper chart. Now, that's calculated a special way. You take the center line of the moving range chart, uh, multiply that by 2.66, and add and subtract that uh, uh, versus the mean of the upper chart, and that gives you your limits. Uh, for the lower chart, you just uh, multiply the uh, average center line by 3.27. And it's best to have about 9 or 10 data. Some authorities uh, suggest you can get by with less, uh, but there's some things that can happen with less that, that aren't as good. So I recommend start with 9 or 10 data. Uh, the one thing that you do not want to do is you do not want to use the sigma function in your calculator or the standard deviation function in your spreadsheet. Uh, that will give you results uh, that you won't like. You have to use the calculation method that I just outlined. Now, one other thing worth noting, because this just clicks in a lot of people's mind very quickly. Just because we use three standard deviations above and below does not imply that we're using a normal distribution. Actually, when Schuert developed these charts, he relied on two things. He relied on the Chebyshev inequality, which is independent of distribution, and he relied on uh, practical experience. Okay. The first rule of interpretation is a point outside the limits. Remember, we said that almost all the normal random variation would occur within the limits or the, as we call them, the natural process limits. Occasionally, you will get an out-of-limit point just by random chance. But if you get one, it's very likely that it's real change. Now, the out-of-limit condition takes care of the big events. But it would be nice to have some way to detect small but persistent change that happens within the limits. So we have three other rules. That is that if you have, uh, if you can lasso three points and two of them are at least two standard deviations from the center line and on the same side of the center line, uh, then that uh, indicates real change. 
The same is true if you can lasso five points and four of them are beyond one standard deviation and on the same side of the center line. And uh, the last rule that we use is eight points on the same side of the line. Taken together, those rules are about as efficient at detecting change as anything that you can use. Here are the data from figure one, and I've turned all four tests on. And what we see is that there's no evidence within the data of any signal or real change. Now, someone might get excited and point to point 12 here and say, that's the lowest, it's an all-time low. But it's not detectably different from the other data. You can say the same thing about point 1, it's the highest. But our tests reveal that there is no difference between that and the other points in the data set. So we would say that this data set is homogenous or in control or that it shows only normal random variation, or that it's stable and predictable. So unless something happens, the next point we can reasonably expect will be near enough to the center line to between, be between the natural process limits. And normally this is good news, unless maybe these are sales data and you're hoping that your new sales manager was going to make a difference. Now, let's look at figure two. This is the complete opposite. Here we have abundant violations. Look, points four, five, and nine violate rule number two. Uh, points 22, 23, 24, 41, 42, 43 violate rule number four. Uh, 31, 32, 46, 48 violate rule three. And of course, uh, point 47 violates rule one. On the lower chart, the difference between points 24 and 25 is too big to easily be explained by normal random variation. So that indicates a real shift in the data. One or two rule violations would attract our interest. And here we have a lot more. Now, if these data are sales volumes and somebody made an improvement at point 25, that's good news. But if this is a critical dimension on a product that you're making and you and your customer want a process that's stable and predictable, which is the normal case, then this could be bad news. Walter Schuert developed the predecessor to the X-bar and R chart in the 1920s in the United States. He was at the Western Electric Hawthorne Works in Illinois. And if you've ever heard the term Hawthorne effect, well, that's where it's from. He worked with some interesting people. You may have heard of W. Edwards Deming or Joseph Duran, very prominent in the early days of, of quality. But in any event, Schuert's predecessor chart was the original process behavior chart. Now, we use the symbol X bar to indicate an estimate of a mean, and we use R to indicate range, and S to indicate standard deviation. So if we're doing X bar and R, we're doing a chart of means and ranges. I looked for a good video on that, and I was a little disappointed. It turned out the only bar X I could conveniently find was a ranch that belonged to a pretty girl and the hero in the cowboy movie saved it for her from the bad guys. And the range they were talking about, well, that had to do with horses and cows. Hmm. Well, unlike the individuals in moving range charts, X bar and R's are based on rational subgroup. The upper chart is the mean of each subgroup and the lower chart is the range. And we might have anywhere between two and seven or eight items in each rational subgroup. Five is possibly the most common. It's convenient and it's easy to deal with. Here's the big problem with X bar and R charts. They're very often taught without rational subgrouping. That's really bad. That conceals rather than reveals. So you need to know about that. What's a rational subgroup? Hmm, that's just simply items that are produced under identical conditions. 
You don't tweak them after the fact. You just uh, produce them as the, as the process runs, but you choose those that are produced under identical conditions. If you're doing something on order entry, you might choose orders that are processed by the same person on the same item and during the same hour. If you're using different equipment, different people, different materials, that's not a rational subgroup. Here's an example. This is synthetic data having to do with uh, filling beverage containers. And our rational subgroups were five consecutive containers off the same machine, same shift, same operator, um, same batch of materials. That is a rational subgroup. The rules for interpretation are about the same as individuals in moving range. Now, the math for the limits is a little different, a little fancier, but uh, if you can do individuals in moving range charts, you can understand and interpret X bar and R. And again, this process is not stable and predictable. Now, I took the same data set and I broke up the rational subgroups. And um, what we get in that case is this. What do we see? Well, there's a couple of little blips that might deserve our attention, but nothing like we saw before. As I said, everything that you would want to know is concealed rather than revealed. A few years ago, I was on a project at a food products company, and using this tool and some uh, similar to it, I discovered that the company was giving away, at production cost, four and a half million dollars worth of free product every year. You can't do that and, and have optimum profitability. That's a big deal. So, in summary, um, X bar and R charts are more sensitive, possibly the best charts that are available, but they're much more often incorrectly done and they do require more data. And like the individuals in moving range chart, it is not required that the data be normally distributed, nor is it required that the lower chart be in control before you interpret the upper chart. Well, just in case you're stuck on a desert island and feel compelled to do an X bar and R chart by hand, here are the constants that you'll need. Uh, the value of the constants depends on how many data you have in each subgroup. So the calculations start with the value of the center line of the range chart. That's R bar. Just multiply that by the appropriate A2 constant, add and subtract that versus the X bar center line to get the limits for the upper chart. Now the lower chart is simpler. You just multiply R bar by the D3 and D4 constants and that gives you your chart limits. Now, let me give you one cautionary note here. <clears throat> Be very selective in the sources that you study. In spite of the ranch joke that I cracked earlier in this video, I did look at a dozen YouTube videos on X bar and R charts. Yeah, plus, I've had a chance to look at a couple of commercial offerings. Of those, not one gave instructions that would lead you to make successful and correct charts. Uh, leads me to believe that there may be more incorrect information out there uh, than there is correct information. Uh, of course, we like our material and we try to make it as correct and simple and clear as we can. If you're interested in reading beyond what we've got, then I recommend you look at the writings of Dr. Donald J. Wheeler. Uh, he has been doing this for a long time. He's a very perceptive and thoughtful author and his material is well researched and you can uh, have confidence in it.